Yeah, uh, this is our, our second panel on specifically looking at renewable energy. And so in this panel, we're going to be covering hydro, solar, and wind. And to start us off on this discussion uh, is Celeste Warner, who is a research analyst for industry data and analysis with American Wind Energy Association, AWEA. And hopefully you've already been at AWEA's booth or you'll make sure that you get there uh, after, after this session. Uh, we've already heard a lot about wind, but we're going to hear a little bit more about all of the changes going on. Thank you, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so if you were in the previous panel, you have heard some facts about wind, so I might repeat a couple things, but um, I'm just going to do kind of an overview of where the wind industry is today and a little bit about what's coming up. So we currently have over 84,000 megawatts of installed capacity with over 53,000 turbines spinning across the U.S. Um, we have turbines in 41 states plus Guam and Puerto Rico. Uh, if you compare that to 2008, when we only had 25,000 megawatts, we've more than tripled our capacity in just eight years. And at the same time, as some others mentioned, costs have come down two-thirds in just seven years, thanks to improvements in technology like what Sandia has been doing. Um, last year alone, we added 82,000, or excuse me, 8,200 megawatts, which was our second consecutive year installing over 8,000 megawatts, um, and the fourth quarter was our second strongest quarter ever. So it's a really good time for wind. We're really seeing a lot of growth, and it's a very exciting time. Uh, in terms of the top states of where is the wind in the U.S., Texas by far is the leader with over 21,000 megawatts, which to put in perspective is a fourth of the total U.S. capacity, and only five countries have more wind than the state of Texas. So pretty impressive. <laughs> um, Iowa and Oklahoma are next with, they both have over 6,500 megawatts of wind. California has over 5,600 megawatts and Kansas has just about 5,000 megawatts. They will soon. Um, we've seen that taller towers and longer blades are really increasing the productivity of these turbines across the US and they're also opening up more areas for development such as, um, for example, North Carolina just brought its first utility scale wind farm online earlier this year to be the 41st state with utility scale wind. So we're seeing more, um, product, more um, activity in kind of those southeast states. In terms of generation, we had large, a large increase in generation in 2016 um, with wind now accounting for 5.5% of the nation's electricity mix, which is enough to power 21 million homes in 2016. And that's up just from 4.6% in 2015, and we expect to see larger um, growth in the years ahead. Looking at states, some states have set some really um, impressive records for their share of wind generation. Iowa is the highest with over 36% of its electricity from wind energy alone, followed by South Dakota and Kansas. Both um, have about 30% of their electricity from wind. Oklahoma and North Dakota both have over 20% of their electricity from wind. And then we have 14 states total that generate 10% or more of their electricity with wind. Um, on the manufacturing side of things, we also have over 500 factories across the U.S. that are making parts for wind turbines. And those are everything from the, the big towers and blades to the small um, electrical subcomponents. We have over 25,000 people working in those factories, working on wind specifically, um, so we're really proud of that. In terms of top states with manufacturing, Ohio has 60 manufacturing facilities making wind products um, just in the state. Texas, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Michigan are also have over 25 factories in the state. Um, so along with all these turbines and factories, we also provide a number of economic benefits and jobs across all 50 states. Um, we're really excited that last year we passed 100,000 jobs for the first time. So we now employ 102,500 Americans across the wind industry, which is up 15,000 from 2015. 
This includes jobs in construction, development, operation, manufacturing, as well as turbine technicians. And we're really proud of the fact that turbine technician is now the, wind turbine technician, is now the fastest growing job in America, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, we have, the wind industry has invested over $143 billion in wind projects in the last decade, with a lot of that going to rural communities that really need it most. Uh, we invested $14 billion in 2016 alone. We also provide rural benefits in the form of land lease payments to the farmers and ranchers and other landowners who are hosting the wind turbines. We now pay $245 million annually to these rural landowners. Um, so we call it, like to call it a drought resistant cash crop that helps keeps farms in the family. Uh, we also provide property tax payments that help pay for local schools, libraries, and hospitals. So really seeing a lot of um, investment in these rural communities. On the environmental side, of course, wind has a number of environmental and clean air benefits. Last year, we avoided 159 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, which is, was 9% of the total electric sector carbon emissions in 2016. So really having a huge impact there. We also avoided $7.4 billion in healthcare, avoided healthcare costs um, from reductions in sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxides. And we avoided 87 billion gallons of water. So those are kind of all the big uh, benefits of wind. I also just wanted to highlight a recent trend that we've been seeing um, that was also mentioned in the previous panel, but we're seeing more and more interest from corporate buyers and other, um, other players outside of the traditional utilities that are buying wind directly. We have major consumer brands, city governments, universities are all signing wind power purchase agreements, including brands like Google, Amazon, Target, General Mills, and General Motors as well. So we're really excited about that. Google will actually be about 95% wind powered worldwide in the next couple years. Um, and in terms of what's coming up, the wind industry is poised for continued growth. We have 21,000 megawatts under construction or in advanced development right now. We, uh, Navigant Consulting also projects that we will have 35 gigawatts installed through 2020, thanks to the long-term stability with the production tax credit, as well as um, an, an additional $85 billion in economic activity through 2020. And we're also on track to meet the Department of Energy's wind vision goal for 10% wind energy by 2020. So thank you, and I'll wrap up. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> So there's a lot going on with the wind, but now you're going to hear uh, from Ross Tyler, who is the strategy and development advisor for the business network for offshore wind, because now there is a lot going on with regard to offshore, with regard to this country. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can you hear me? Okay, um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> you've just heard from uh, my colleague here from the American Wind Energy Association and there's a couple of numbers that really stick out. We're talking about investments in onshore wind and I think you cited $143 billion and there's 102,000 uh, people that are employed uh, in the industry. What we're doing in the business network is basically trying to echo and emulate the onshore wind industry. So let me just give you a little bit of uh, an overview of where, what we do and, uh, and where we stand as, as an industry and, and where we stand as a country with respect to the world um, offshore wind sector. So the Business Network for Offshore Wind is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization and our, our focus is to support the development of a global, robust and competitive US offshore wind supply chain. So we don't do the, the work ourselves, um, but we are trying to bring and empower the US business community um, to actually do the, the construction and build the offshore wind farms. So we're not a trade association, but we are a membership-based organization. And uh, since our inception in 1912, the network has brought together many of the businesses and governments, both domestically and internationally, to educate and prepare our companies here in the United States, including historically disadvantaged businesses, uh, to enter into the offshore wind supply chain market. 
We spend a lot of our time trying to uh, work with local companies such as welders, tug operators, uh, shipbuilders, manufacturers and IT companies, established companies that may not have had insights into what the offshore wind industry can bring them. And we try to give them guidance as to how they might be able to find their way into this huge potential of the offshore wind supply chain. So as a result of our activities, um, we, we've got recognition as a coalescing, coalescing uh, force for the offshore wind supply chain. And we work basically to try to help with um, supporting federal, state, and local policies in advance of creating this offshore wind supply chain. We also provide education and we try to facilitate partnerships between businesses to increase the capacity and expertise that we have in our um, business community here domestically with which to be able to plan, construct, operate, and maintain offshore wind farms, the same functions that you've heard Celeste talk about already. So I have a couple of numbers that I'd like to share with you, which is Europe has right now the greatest amount of offshore wind deployed, which is um, approximately 12 gigawatts. And um, <clears throat> to put that in kind of perspective, 120 megawatt offshore wind farm might um, power 30,000 homes. So what we're seeing is in Europe, we have, um, we have about 3 million homes being generated, being powered by offshore wind. So in contrast, where are we today here in the United States? Well, we only have five turbines. Five is an easy number. You, if Celeste asks you how many, you know, you're gonna lose all those numbers. Five, remember five. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so, um, but Europe has been working for over the past two decades and enjoys a reported, and here's an important number, because it's very close to that 102, it's 93,000 jobs. So offshore wind in Europe has produced today 93,000 jobs. So now you can see why our efforts are basically trying to emulate and work in shadow and follow the onshore wind industry here. Um, so many of the near uh, sited shore, um, sorry, the near shore sites in Europe, the wind farms, have already been developed. And so the developers are now, along with their supply chain businesses, are looking for new markets. And Asia and the United States are those two new markets. And so we are competing. We are competing with Asia to attract the, uh, to, to attract the European developers and the supply chain companies to come here. And there's a reason why we should be interested in this, and that is because the supply chain uh, value is predicted to reach $144 billion by 2020, a number that's not so far from what you heard earlier. So in short, the offshore wind industry presents a golden opportunity for the United States in developing a new industry doesn't compete with onshore, doesn't compete with any of the other clean energy technologies. And we have an opportunity for domestic job growth and simultaneously create clean energy. So the US is arriving at the offshore wind sector and industry rather late, I would say. Uh, the work started over 10 years ago and it's taking a long time to gain momentum, but we can catch up. We can catch up and I suspect we could even um, we could even go further than the Europeans. For the traditional proven technology in which the turbines are supported with fixed towers in the ocean floor, the US can become a dominant player through its market size. We have scale. We have scale that's much larger than the European offshore wind market, and we can use the technology that the Europeans have kindly developed over the last 20 years. This means the US has the potential for an accelerated path to reach the same number of gigawatts as the European market, and I'm going to show you in a minute or tell you in a minute how that's possible. So the US has in its favor also untapped innovation. We have to remember we're a creative nation and we are innovative both in finance and in technology. So there are a few technologies that are being uh, developed right now to meet the needs of our East Coast. Um, <clears throat> But we're also making advances with the next generation uh, of wind turbines, which are being made basically wind f for floating, floating wind farms. In this case, the wind turbines are not physically supported from the ocean floor, but they're floating. And uh, much of the engineering of this comes from the oil and gas industry. And this next generation of offshore wind technology opens up markets along our west coast. Up to now, it's predominantly been on our east coast. 
So this is featured, for those that don't know, is because that's where the ocean I is very deep. There's no ability to put the turbines uh, uh, in, into the ocean floor. So all these factors are going to help drive down the cost of power that is produced from offshore wind. And with, the increased, dem excuse me, <coughs> with increased demand in the energy mix, particularly along the coastal states. So at the present time, as I mentioned earlier, we've only got one offshore wind farm, which is um, in Rhode Island, state waters off Block Island. So um, the real potential is where, where there is scale, and that's beyond the three-mile state water limit, and this will be in federal waters. And our Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the regulator and has worked hard over the past eight to nine years and remains responsible for the leasing of the ocean floor um, for the use um, for offshore wind and the permitting process. In contrast, uh, the, the, uh, the states are, and, their, represent and their, their respective utilities are responsible for the procurement of the electricity. So at the present time, in addition to the 30 megawatts, the five turbines off Block Island, we also have committed nine megawatt, 90 megawatts that will go to Long Island. Maryland has just approved the rate payer to purchase 368 megawatts. Massachusetts has a law to procure 1,600 megawatts in tranches of 400 um, over the coming years. Governor Como has stated ambitions to have uh, 2,400 megawatts, and New Jersey is promising 3,500. Add all this together, you've got almost 8 gigawatts of power. That is two-thirds of what Europe has today and has created in 20 years. We can't stop there. I'm nearly going to stop. So just wait with you. One more page. But we can't stop there. We can't stop there as an industry. Um, these numbers <coughs> um, reflect the future possibilities of offshore wind in the various states that have supportive policies, but there are very few that have definitive um, times and commitments for the purchase of the power. That is something that we all need to be working on. But the industry the groups that we are working with, the businesses, they're calling for a consistent pipeline of one to two gigawatts of, of um, committed offshore wind per year. This will provide the economic returns and the justification to build the needed port infrastructure to withstand the size and the weights of these large offshore wind components, some of which are in excess of 1,200 tons. So in conclusion, I would just ask you to reflect for a moment. Denmark, which is the size of Maryland, started two decades ago with, 50, sorry, with 11 turbines for one offshore wind project. And today the country employs 50,000 people dominating the global offshore wind industry. So our mission is um, to help the businesses harness the European expertise in order to contribute building this domestic offshore wind farm. And, um, and really from there we can, along with the technology for floating platforms, this country has the opportunity to become a dominant player in the global offshore wind market. Final words, offshore wind equals onshore jobs. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Another industry ready to explode in terms of growth and where we are able to really take advantage of all of the experience uh, that is coming from from Europe, and um, and so just stay tuned as this starts to move forward. And I must say, I've seen the turbines at Block Island, pretty awesome. Okay, so we're now going to hear from Jacob Irving, who is the president of the Canadian Hydropower Association. Hydro is very old and also very new in terms of all of the wonderful services that it has been providing us for so many years uh, in a very clean, renewable way. And I should also say we're very glad that Jacob is back with us again this year because the Canadian Hydro Association has been partnering with U.S. companies and state governments and utilities for many, many years. And it's an important way for us to really work together and improve everybody's economic uh, efficiency and also clean energy portfolio.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carol. It's always a pleasure to come and speak to you as a Canadian. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting, we're often uh, told that as Canadians that sometimes we're a little too polite. Um, sometimes we're a little too apologetic. So um, I guess I'll apologize for my presentation in advance. Um, sorry, everybody. Um, but uh, I'm also told whenever I come here by my American friends, you know, as a Canadian, you've got to be more simple and you've got to be more direct with your message. So I've had many years of practice, thank, thanks to Carol and everyone coming to here to speak to you. So I guess what I would probably start off by saying to all of you, my American friends here, is that you have a very dirty electricity system. <laughs> you do. Um, what gives me the gumption to say that, coming down from the north to you? Because we have a very clean electricity system. And this, I'm not afraid to brag about. Um, over half of our, hydro, of, of our electricity comes from hydropower in Canada. It is the dominant source of electricity generation in our country. In your country, over half is still thermal. And what's really important is that you're 10 times our size. So the size of the challenge for cleaning up your electricity system in this country is daunting. Um, I present the Canadian hydropower in the context of a good news story, hopefully a pleasant surprise. I put it in the sense that um, I like to think of it as we're kind of like the hundred dollar bill that is in your winter coat pocket right now. Uh, you forgot that it's there, you don't know that it's there, but it's there. That's Canadian hydropower. Um, Hey, quickly, uh, who is the world's largest generator of hydropower? China. Oh, China, it's number one. Who's number two? Brazil. Canada. <laughs> the number one hydropower generator in the world has 1.3 billion people. The number two genera hydropower generator in the world has 35 million people. So in Canada, we like to say that we box above our weight when it comes to hydropower. It's our number one source of electricity, 61%, and it's growing. And so this is where the analogy to the $100 bill in the winter coat comes in. How much more do you think we can grow in Canada? I mean, when you're the second largest generator in the world, you kind of think, well, you must be kind of tapped out, right? You must be sort of done. It is the majority way you make electricity. How much of this stuff do you have left? Well, in Canada, and we can talk about it in my booth later, we can more than double our current installed capacity for hydropower. We have the second largest land mass on the planet. We're second to Russia in terms of land mass. And we have the third largest amount of surface water on the planet. We have a lot of geography. We have a lot of topography. We have a lot of water. We have a lot of hydropower. So in many ways, one of the reasons why we have such a huge capacity why we've done, is because we have such a natural strength in it. There is no denying it. And our humble suggestion to you, our friends to the south, who are 10 times our size and who have such a dirty electricity system by comparison, is that you maximize this. And the good news is, is that there already is a strong relationship. Uh, we've been trading electricity back and forth between our two countries since electricity was invented. Um, we've strung lines across borders. Uh, there's over 35 interconnection points. Um, the majority of the electricity we send you is hydropower. We'll generate about 375 terawatt hours in a year. We send you about 60 of that. So a decent proportion. Um, it means a lot to Canada. It means a lot for us in terms of export. We think that there's a natural um, uh, advantage, mutual advantage that happens there. It's good for both of us. Um, but as strong and impressive as all of this is, um, you can try and guess how, what is the percentage of Canadian hydropower in the United States? It's less than 1%. So less than 1% of your electricity system comes from Canadian hydropower. So our humble proposition to you is maybe that could grow a little bit. Um, for us, I mean, if it grew to 2%, it would be double for us. We'd be over the moon. 
and you might not even notice. And the advantage you get from it is with our, the Canadian hydropower that I'm talking about, this 160,000 megawatts of undeveloped potential that we have, it, this is all new greenfield hydropower that we're talking about. This is not talking about powering existing dams. It's not talking about refurbishing. It's not about talking added capacity. It's about brand new hydropower projects that could be built across Canada to the service of Canada and North America, both of us. And to do the things that hydro is really good at, which is essentially um, balancing grids and providing reliable backup to the energy system. I mean, hydropower, the one thing about us that uh, no one's ever beaten us on in the 130 years of our history, this goes for US hydro, Canadian hydro, anywhere, is we are the most dispatchable form of electricity there is. You can turn us on and off faster than any other source. And that is hugely advantageous on the grid. We shape, I mean, we, we don't just shape uh, other renewables, wind and solar. I mean, we, we've shaped coal, we've shaped natural gas, because you can turn us on and off faster than any other source. And with storage, uh, we offer maximum flexibility. And so, again, to me, my basic job whenever I come and speak to American audiences is it's deceptively simple. It's just to let you know we exist. We're already, we're already involved in a very positive, mutually beneficial, positive relationship. We are sending you this power already. You're sending us power back in return. We're sending you clean hydropower mostly. Um, but there could be more of that to our mutual advantage. And this hydropower in Canada has helped to bring on new renewables, wind and solar, um, in our country. And it also helps um, bring them on in the States too. This is not a complicated relationship. It's not new. Um, really, all you have to do is just more of it. So it's to take a winning formula and to do more. Now, the tricky part with us um, in Canada is we have this large undeveloped potential. We have a very small population. We have a lot of natural resources. That's sort of the story of our country. We live next to the most sophisticated market the world has ever seen. 350 million uh, market consumers to the south. Um, we believe that, that more of this can be had. But really the trick in many ways is the U.S. sending enough signals to us that you're interested. Uh, we can't force feed you anything. We can't hard sell you our hydropower. It's up to us to let you know that we exist, that we're helping, and that we can help even more. And in that regard, on our side of the board, I just wanted to, to, to note that uh, we're, we've, we've seen the benefit of this, we're seeing the benefit of it, and the partnership between renewables has really strengthened. We, two years ago, formed a group called the Canadian Council on Renewable Electricity, and that brings together Canadian hydro, wind, solar, marine, um, ocean, tidal, kinetics. We formed a group to try and speak on policy um, with a concerted voice at the federal level. And this is important because, you know, in, in markets we compete. Um, we compete strongly. Everybody wants their technology to be first in line and, and to, to gain market share. And that's terrific and there's a lot of good things that come with that. But when you look at the global um, crisis in terms of climate change, when you look at North America, uh, Canada as well, the job is so huge that no one of us can do it by ourselves. We really have to work together. Even Canada, this huge undeveloped hydropower potential that I've just taught you about and that hopefully you're excited about. This 160,000 megawatts, if we were to build it all tomorrow and plug it directly into the United States to help you out, we'd only be able to turn off half the coal production in the United States. Now, that's kind of sad when you think about it, but it's also kind of exciting because we can't do it all for you, nor would we ever pretend to. We're not gonna be opportunistic Canadians coming from the North trying to solve your problems for you. But we can be definitely part of the solution. And if we work with wind, solar, everyone else together, and we all click together in the best ways possible, now we can really attack some of the big problems that we're facing. So I guess the big messages that I wanna just leave you with is that uh, Canada, we exist, we're helping, <laughs> we can help even more. And we all really have to work together if we're truly going to lick this problem called global climate change. We can't, um, 
shoot down each other's technologies. We have to figure out how we all click together and actually show the rest of the world that North American lead. So, thank you. Thanks, Jacob. And we promise never to forget that you exist. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing, Jacob also made a remark uh, with regard to uh, the uh, association that they have been part of building in terms of the Canadian uh, renewables. And one of the things that I think is so important is that hydro, once again, is a host of technologies. And so our next speaker is going to talk about one of those, uh, and that's Megan Harwood, who is the Policy and Government Affairs Lead for Natal Energy, Inc. Hi, everyone. So we're going to take away our industry hat for a moment and talk a little bit about specific technology, um, which is Natel Energy's hydro engine. So I come from Natel Energy. We're based in Alameda, California, and we're a manufacturer of a proprietary hydropower turbine technology called the hydro engine, which is an innovative low head distributed hydropower turbine. So not many people think of hydropower as a distributed asset or let alone think of a lot of new innovation in the hydropower industry because it's been a long, around for so long. But we're trying to change that explicitly with our new technology and able to, in order to uh, open up new markets for new hydropower development and to create a path forward for cost effective and quick and hydropower to be brought online quickly uh, through low head and smaller distributed projects that can then aggregate up to utility scale but come online much more quickly than larger hydropower projects. So Natel was founded in 2009 by two siblings actually. They're both MIT engineers by training and their dad came up with the idea for the turbine for the first time in the, during the energy crisis in the 70s. And it wasn't commercialized at the time but they reintroduced the idea in 2009. Um, by G and Abe Schneider, the founders. One of them is our current CEO, and one of them is the current CTO. And in 2009, we we had about five years of product development that followed, a lot of which was aided by the DOE EERE program, specifically the water power program and grant money, um, grant money from that program specifically. And so after those first five years or so, 2015 and 2016, we saw our first two commercial installs. Um, and those were, one was an uh, existing retrofit of a drop in an irrigation canal in, in central Oregon, which is part of a larger 10 megawatt portfolio that's currently under development. And one was at a non-power dam um, here on the East Coast in, in Maine. Um, and so Natel set on a path to um, essentially create this distributed hydropower approach. And in order to do that, you need to drive down the cost substantially at low head drops. So you haven't seen a lot of these kind of irrigation and non-power dam sites develop to date because it hasn't really penciled out economically. So we set out to create a turbine technology that could both address the mechanical and the civil components of hydropower projects and drive down those costs substantially. Um, so Natel is driven by a vision for a more sustainable and climate resilient model for hydropower development to deliver new renewable energy. Um, that's both complementary to solar, wind, battery storage technologies. As, as our speakers before have mentioned, there's a slew of technologies out there and we really got to go full steam ahead with all of the above. Um, and they're all complementary to each other in many ways. Um, and also to take an approach where we're looking at the watershed needs and the watershed uh, co-benefits up front so that instead of mitigating for impacts after the effect like much uh, like many projects have done to date you can then take those considerations into the the civil works approach at the beginning and be able to both deliver watershed co-benefits in a, uh, in accordance with your project but also create a much quicker path for permitting and and um, yep in permitting moving forward and then licensing um, so Natel's hydro engine accomplishes these cost savings really quickly. I can give more details on the technology itself at the booth in the in the foyer, but we uh, we accomplish those cost savings by material and design innovations that drive significantly um, re uh, reduced costs on the civil work side in particular and drive down the footprint of individual low head projects. Um, and these. These innovations are enabled by the hydro engine technology itself, which improves project economics, making the minimum financially viable hydropower project smaller than it would have been before. So physically smaller yet still financially viable projects allow developers to employ a more versatile, flexible, and creative approach to project design, to development, and to operation of the plant. So the hydro engine is designed for projects of 60 feet of net head and lower, whereas conventional hydros usually, you know, we've seen projects that are hundreds of feet tall. 
um, with individual turbines that are rated up to 1.5 megawatts, but with projects where you can aggregate up to 10 megawatts per individual project size. Um, so there are three major areas that we're focused on for new hydropower development. The first two of which focus on existing infrastructure. So if folks are familiar with the DOE Hydrovision Report, um, you'll know some of these numbers, but if not, I'd encourage you to visit it. Um, NHA worked very, worked hand in hand with the DOE on that report as well. Um, and so for the two existing infrastructure applications, the first is in conduit hydropower. Um, so that's existing irrigation canals, wastewater treatment plant outflows, other pipe scenarios, um, and non-power dams. So there's um, a large market of existing non-power dams that are there for some other reason, whether that be flood mitigation, recreation, transportation, et cetera. Um, and according to the rec these reports that were conducted by the Department of Energy and the Oak Ridge National Lab, there's an estimated 2 gigawatts or so of potential in existing conduits across the U.S. and an estimated 12 gigawatts at non-power dams. Of the 12 gigawatts at non-power dams, which is 80, across 80,000 dams in the U.S., um, over 70 percent of those are at sites lower than 50 feet of, of head of drop. And that's kind of our sweet spot as a technology. And that's why a lot of these projects haven't penciled out to date, it's because they, it is a, a lower head application. Um, development of these sites provides not just new, reliable, and predictable renewable energy that does, as I mentioned, uh, balance well with, with solar wind energy technologies, but it also provides a new opportunity for investment in our water infrastructure, which is very much needed. So providing, by providing an additional revenue source, for example, to an irrigation district or a water municipality who is looking to install hydropower in their system, um, they then get an additional source of revenue through a land site lease or through, owner, or through uh, future ownership of the project to invest in piping infrastructure if needed, to invest in um, new, uh, to invest in other, uh, other water management and energy efficiency, water efficiency associated with their, um, with their footprint in their, their overall system. Um, a there have been a couple of really good examples of this, so I just want to highlight a few so that you can get an understanding of how we play in the kind of water energy nexus in a way that uh, isn't usually discussed. And so in, in Central Oregon, we have a slew of projects, and um, there, has, there have been a, a couple of districts there, including Three Sisters Irrigation District there in Central Oregon. They, they have used revenue from their hydropower projects to reinvest in um, open canal piping of all of their, of their canals, and that increase, increases the water efficiency, so they're able to more accurately deliver to the irrigators and farmers who have requirements for, for water use, but it also allows you to leave more water at the start in stream, which then creates habitat for, um, for, for fish spawning. Um, in California, similarly, through the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which was a policy passed a few years back, uh, irrigation districts are required to invest in their water infrastructure and in driving groundwater recharge, so in driving some restoration of their watersheds. So that's a really, so uh, in conduit hydropower is a really good way for them to generate an additional and diversified revenue source to then invest in, in their water infrastructure itself. So finally, there are new opportunities that exist in new stream reach as well. So that's not existing infrastructure. Um, so NGOs like the American Rivers, the Nature Conservancy, and Trout Unlimited have done um, a substantial amount of work outlining frameworks by which new sustainable hydropower can be developed in accordance to a couple of criteria related to fish passage, related to uh, total project footprint, and other environmental criteria specifically. And then the, meanwhile, a lot of resource agencies, including NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service, have, who have been focusing on watershed restoration work, so purely just restoration, increasing stream flows, and um, trying to control sediment, water temperature, creating new habitat for fish, have looked at low head check structures explicitly for creating wetlands or, or enabling those types of benefits. So, there, so we have been working very closely with those entities as well, as well to identify opportunities where new distributed low head hydropower can then be paired with watershed restoration efforts and you can then deliver uh, watershed benefits on the back of energy revenues, both delivering new energy and watershed benefits. So we believe there's a really active opportunity to develop new hydro in degraded watersheds and deliver those benefits. And the success of community renewables programming across the country 
Um, that's, that's inclusive of solar, wind, hydro at a smaller scale, and that's at a community level, has been very successful in doing this, including in some of the Oregon projects I mentioned earlier, as well as um, much needed investment in water infrastructure and financing of water infrastructure or energy infrastructure projects. Um, and then finally, programs like the DOE ERE program or the USDA REAP program have been very vital for, um, for spawning some of these projects. And I welcome any questions at my booth in the foyer as well. Great, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Megan. And we will now turn to Dave Zayas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dave Zayas, who is the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Technical Services with NHA, the National Hydro Association. Okay, good afternoon. Um, you guys have been loaded up with a lot of stats. Um, so instead of giving you more, I'm actually going to read this from cover to cover. <laughs> We're just talking about that. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to come back to this. This has been mentioned. So uh, I'll try not to duplicate what you've heard already from some of my colleagues here. But um, I work for the National Hydropower Association. We are located here in D.C. If you haven't been to our booth yet, please do so. Uh, we're Standard Trade Association. We re represent conventional hydro, pump storage, and also marine and hydrokinetics. So similar to what was described earlier in terms of offsite potential for wind, there's similar offsite or potential here in the United States for marine and hydrokinetics. Um, again, similarly behind compared to Europe, uh, but I'm not going to talk more about that today. Instead, I'm going to actually will provide you a few stats of the hydropower industry in the United States, talk about some of the growth opportunities, and then some of the challenges to growth. So first, hydro is the largest provider of renewable energy in the United States. We have installed capacity of just over 100 gigawatts, so 100,000 megawatts. 22 gigawatts of that is pump storage. Uh, so those 22 gigawatts of pump storage make up about 98% of all energy storage in the U.S. Uh, currently, just over 40% of renewable energy generation in the U.S. Uh, historically, very affordable source of electricity, uh, one of the cheapest that's available. Jacob earlier touched on some of the critical baseload and reliability services that hydropower has always provided in terms of grid stability. Um, but something that hasn't been mentioned yet, and I think it's worth a, a, men a note here, is that is the multi-purpose kind of attributes of these projects. So a lot of hydropower projects, in addition to generating, you know, clean renewable energy, they provide their critical infrastructure provides flood control, irrigation benefits, navigation, recreation, and the list goes on. So there's a lot of those benefits uh, that we don't talk about um, frequently. So with those stats now kind of behind us. What are the opportunities for hydro? Last year, Department of Energy, and it was just mentioned by Megan, here's the, this is the executive summary, but the cover is the same on the full report. It's a great nightstand kind of uh, evening reading. Uh, it's called The Hydropower Vision, a new chapter for America's first renewable electricity uh, source. So importantly, uh, there's a roadmap in this document that identified uh, the hydropower industry in the United States can grow by 50 gigawatts by 2050. Those 50 gigawatts are found primarily in new pump storage projects across the U.S. Uh, it's found on powering non-powered dams and also then doing your efficiency upgrades and upgrades at existing facilities. I would also like to make a quick plug for the Department of Energy's water power program that was responsible for developing this report. Um, it was a multi-year effort. NHA was involved with it every step of the way. Um, so, you know, the water power program is really critical to our industry and for R&D, for reports like this. They also support the MHK side. Um, and I think the last thing I would mention, too, is that of those 50 gigawatts, those are sustainable gigawatts of development, too, um, that was ultimately concluded in this report. So what are the challenges to realizing that growth? And I think I'm going to list three, but two of them in terms of the growth are the licensing and the relicensing process at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You know, it can take 10 years or longer to license a new project or even to relicense an existing project. That's not good for investors. Uh, it's just not good for certainty. Uh, so we work every day to reduce those delays, any duplication in the process, but are very mindful not to undermine any existing environmental statutes or protections. Second, I think, challenge to achieving the growth is the market recognition of hydropower. So we feel, I think, as an industry, or it's generally accepted as an industry, that it's, hydro is not appropriately valued in the United States. You can look at a number of policies that were set in place from the uh, federal tax incentives from PTC and ITC. Hydro was eligible. It's expired for hydro. But even when it was eligible, it received half the credit 
of our uh, other renewable counterparts. If you look at state RPS policies across the country, hydropower is, you know, has a hard time playing in those markets because of the way eligibility is defined based on the size of the project, when it was put in place, uh, among others. So we work on those two issues quite frequently. And third, I think it's a pretty young crowd in here. I don't know how many are full-time staff, interns, or where you're all going to be heading, but workforce development is a big issue for the industry. We kind of call it the silver tsunami. Um, we have a lot of people retiring. Uh, we're very interested in, you know, how do we attract uh, the younger generation to get into hydropower. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking for jobs. Um, and that's it. I'm going to leave it at that. I know we got one more speaker. I'll make sure we leave time. Um, and I, I know you've already been peppered with a lot of stats as well, but thank you for the opportunity. You know, a recurrent theme today has also been in terms of thinking about the, the potential in terms of job career opportunities and that in so many areas across the country in terms of, of the manufacturing that's required, all of these different technologies and their deployment, how there are jobs that are waiting for somebody to fill them. So now we're going to hear from Christopher Mansour, who is the uh, Vice President for Federal Affairs for the Solar Energy Industries Association. See ya. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Carol. Okay, I got two minutes. It's going to be real fast, okay? So get your pens ready. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Well, I got 12 minutes. I'm going to read this much slower then. Here we go. I got, I got more, more numbers for you, too. Um, See, so yeah, so we're the Solar Energy Industry Association, a trade association for the American solar industry across the board from manufacturing right up to installing on people's houses. Um, right now there's about 9,000 companies working in the United States across all 50 states. Um, it's a lot of small businesses, about 85% of those businesses are less than 20 employees, so that's something we're really excited about that they continue that kind of long-term growth. At the end of 2016, we had 260,000 Americans working in solar. Um, 2016 was a real banner year for solar in general. We doubled the amount of installed uh, solar that they had uh, done in 2014, uh, 15. So we did 15 gigawatts in 2016. Um, as I mentioned, we had 260,000 jobs at the end of 2016, and that was up from 210,000 that we had at the end of uh, 2015. In 2016, one out of every 50 jobs in the United States, new jobs coming online, uh, were, were the solar job. Uh, a medium salary was $25 an hour. So again, you can see between hydro, solar, wind, it's actually a really great source for people to be able to come up uh, and make a really good income uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, solar was actually the top single source of new electrical generation capacity in the United States. 39% of all electricity generating that came on in 2016 was, a, was from solar. We installed a new solar project, and this includes houses as well. New solar solar project every uh, 84 seconds. So it was a great year for us. About $23 billion invested in solar. To shift real quickly to the rooftop issue, uh, about two-thirds of the installations in the United States are utility scale. So it's the bigger plants, one to five to 500 megawatt plants and up. Uh, but they're the solar uh, uh, distributed generation side of things on, on people's rooftops with homeowners uh, primarily has also been a great uh, uh, growth industry for us as well. Just as uh, one stat is in 2016, the beginning of 2016, we hit our first million homes that actually had a solar project or a solar facility on its on its rooftop. We'll hit the second two million by the end of 2018. We'll hit we'll double that again to four million homes uh, by the end of 2021. So, the rooftop uh, industry itself is growing exponentially. In 2017, so far, it's been uh, it's also been a strong year. Uh, we added two gigawatts in the first quarter of this year. It's the sixth straight quarter that we've done more than two uh, gigawatts uh, uh, in each quarter. Uh, and the other milestone was utility scale project prices dropped below one dollar uh, per watt and, and installed. And that's for the first time. The DOE, Department of Energy, had a goal of hitting that one dollar watt that was three years out. So we hit it three years early, which we're pretty excited about. Um, According to uh, GTM research, we should install a total of about 12 to 12 and a half gigawatts in 2017. Uh, 2016 was a big run-up year because of the investment tax credit, uh, and so now uh, with that extended, uh, it actually gives people a time to, to um, space out their development a little bit more. So we'll have a little bit of a downward turn in 2017. Uh, 
also according to GM, uh, GTM research, uh, they expect 36 states will be at grid parity for rooftop solar by the end of 2017. So that's really important. It allows people to say, it actually does make sense for me to go out and, and invest in solar for my home um, uh, across pretty, a, a big swath of the United States. Solar prices continue to go down. We had a 63% drop over the last five years, so that's still being driven down. Part of that is the hardware itself, the panels, the inverters, the other uh, balance of systems uh, process, but a lot of it is because our companies are getting better and more efficient and uh, uh, quicker at their installations. It was, in the past, the rooftop uh, company might do two to three installations in a week with, a, with one crew. Now they're going to do two to three in a day, given the, the fact that they've improved, improved their racking systems, their permitting uh, process, and, and, and a whole range of, of uh, changes that have driven down the cost, not only for rooftop solar, but also for utility scale as well. Um, just looking ahead real quickly. In 2010, we had less than a gigawatt of solar in the United States. Uh, by the end of 2017, we should have, uh, four, as, I'm sorry, right now in 2017, we have 42 gigawatts total. And by 2022, we'll, be, we'll triple that to, to 127 gigawatts of solar. So the future looks good that way. Uh, by 2022 as well, 26 states will have at least one gigawatt of solar installed. So again, we're growing into new parts of the United States. You'll see this in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Uh, and that's, that's growing pretty exponentially in those southern states as well. Uh, dollars uh, alone between 2017, between now and the end of 2021, an additional $84 billion in uh, investments in installations. A whole lot of figures. I told you I was going to give you a lot of numbers. Um, but uh, now we leave time for some questions and answers, too. Wow, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Another very, very exciting story. And because of that, We've got five minutes, folks, so um, uh, before we need to uh, move to the next panel. Um, so were there any questions? I thought I saw a hand. Okay. Sure. Well, as the National Trade Association, we try to look at, we, we work on federal issues, uh, that's what I do. We also do state issues. And in addition to that, we have a series of, I think it's 12 state affiliates, uh, uh, CIA affiliates that we work with really closely on a whole range of issues. Um, from my spend, uh, standpoint as the federal uh, affairs, uh, the VP for federal affairs, um, the national issues we work on are like the investment tax credit, which benefits every single solar company of no matter how size or shape it was. So that was a really big victory to get that extended until 2021. Um, the other issue we're working on really closely right now, consuming a lot of our times, and I got to get back to it. We're doing a North Carolina lobby day to day. Um, is this trade case that's come up uh, with the U.S. International Trade Commission, which uh, there's a company, two companies come forward trying to, uh, they are requesting uh, tariffs on imported panels that would double the price of panels and affect everybody's ability to actually make their projects work, whether it's a utility scale or uh, uh, a DG, uh, a distributed generation scale. Um, we have a thousand member companies, and that's everything from, like you say, the Teslas and the Vivens and the Sunruns on the big side to people who have a couple pickup trucks and some ladders. Uh, so we we do try to represent the entire range of the of the industry and and work real carefully and closely with uh, with companies to try to solve their issues with their state governments, but also the the um, federal governments as well. Federal government. So sure. Great. Thanks. We have time for one more question. If anybody has one. Okay, any last words from any of you? Any points that you wanted to make? It's sunny outside, we're making money. 
You know, I, and I think that's an important point that, you know, that throughout today, one of the things I hope that, like, like me, I hope that like, I hope that you, like me, have been really um, e excited about what we've been hearing in terms of the number of jobs, the growth in all of these technologies and these resources across the country uh, in basically every state the growth that it represents in terms of looking at supply chains and in terms of manufacturing, uh, as well as what this means, whether it's for uh, supporting of agriculture in terms of land for, for wind turbines to looking at what it means for development of all sorts of uh, hydro, different kinds of technologies, um, that there is just an enormous potential where we've gone from looking at distributed to also now uh, uh, very much utility scale, the whole role of storage that enables a lot more to happen. So we are really looking at a changed and changing world that is happening very, very quickly. And so I, this is a really good time for clean energy. And so I hope everybody is feeling that excitement, that buzz, and that we really need to be about making that transition and making it happen ever faster. So thanks so much for being here. Make sure you follow up with folks. Make sure you get to all the exhibits, both in the Gold Room over here in 2168, as well as the foyer. Let people know that you really appreciate their being here. Thank you so much.